Welcome to the Coaching and Therapy channel. So this channel is quite close to my heart because I train coaches and embodiment. I mean, why? Because if you don't work with the body, you're missing a lot. Whether you're a coach, a therapist, facilitator, whatever, that's how you go deep quickly. That's how you do stuff that's sticky. We have to take the body into account. This channel is sponsored by Dylan Newcomb and Uzazu Embodied Intelligence. Dylan is a genius, quite simply put, and I wouldn't say that about many people in this field. I've been uh, studying with Dylan for, God, the first time was probably 10 years ago in the Netherlands. He speaks fluent Dutch, by the way, as well as Korean and a few other languages. What I love about Dylan is his ability to make models of things, uh, looking at how embodiment works. His system, Uzazu, U-Z-A-Z-U, uh, is really all about state shifting. So I think of him as the sort of master of state changing, how we can shift our state, our client state, and how we can develop ourselves through those different um, ways of being. So I think for coaches and therapists, it's like easy to learn, practical toolkit. I've used it myself over the years. So if you want a three day online training with Dylan, then look at the link below, or you can go to Uzazu, U-Z-A-Z-U.org. And even easier, he's got an embodied assessment there you can do as well. We all love doing these little tests about ourselves, but this is an embodied one. So there you go. Welcome to the Coaching and Therapy channel. I'm gonna be on this one a lot, just because there's lots of cool people on here. Lots of people, I think, you know, well worth a listen. Uh, embodiment in, the, in facilitation is so necessary. So from me to you, welcome. Okay. Um, thank you, Sandra, for playing the video. Um, and moving back, David, to you. So I would like to introduce you with a few words. So we have today David Brown. Who and you are a co-active life coach and mediator, and also learning and teaching for 30 years martial arts. Um, you are also an author and founder of Potentiality Coaching, and I'm uh, pretty honored to give the floor to you. So, welcome. Thank you very much, Martha. So. Uh... And welcome to everybody. Oh, hi, Catalina, you've just come on. So that's lovely to see you. Lovely to see all your smiley faces. Okay, so I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. And uh, as Martha said, what we're gonna be doing today is exploring archetypes. And uh, rather than it just being uh, an intellectual knowledge and having an intellectual understanding of it, what we're also gonna be doing is having a, an embodied experience that therefore taps into your inner wisdom and your uh, inner resources. So uh, in my experience, what uh, archetypes are really great for is using them to uh, connect and facilitate in your personal growth. So who here, just in the chat really quickly, who hears into the personal growth journey? just a yes or a thumbs up. Yeah, and in the chat as well. Yeah, loads of people. Yeah, fantastic, great. And then because the personal growth is so important, then that spills into lots of different areas in your life. So it'll step into your leadership, so your personal leadership and leadership of other people. Uh, it will spill into your relationships. So intimate relationships, work relationships and uh, parenting as well, of course. And um, also for your business and career. So if you're self-employed or if you're working through the career ladder, then learning ways to tap into your archetype so that you can get into that inner wisdom and resources is really important. And also for coaching. So do we have any coaches on the call? People that would call themselves life coaches or of any kind? Yeah, Siobhan, Thea, yeah, Catalina as well. And Archer too. Yeah, great. David too. Yeah. So what I found as well is that archetypes are brilliant for you as a coach because they really help you to uh, self-regulate and allow you to be in a place where you can choose how you show up for the client. And also archetypes are a really good opportunity to give resources to our clients so that um, we can help them create the life that they really want for themselves. So for me, archetypes have been really, really powerful. And when I started coaching back in 2013, um, I'd already done about 25 years of martial arts and I was 
looking for a way to integrate martial arts and with coaching because that was where my skill set was that's where I felt most alive and most engaged and every time I spoke with people uh, about that they'd say oh yeah martial arts and coaching that that really must be a very powerful combination that's that's awesome and I'd be like yeah great yeah I, I, I agree with you but I, I just didn't really know how how to do that um, so intuitively I knew that it would be the right thing to do, but I just didn't really know how. Um, and for a long time, I struggled to try and work out how I was going to do that. And then I watched a YouTube video of, um, Tony Robbins and generally I'm not a huge fan of his, but, um, somebody had said that he, he was doing a, a six day, uh, course in Hawaii back in 2001. And that week happened to coincide with 9-11. And there's this edited YouTube video. It's about two hours where he really does some incredibly powerful coaching using archetypes. And my experience of that was that it was really transformational for the people on the call. If you type in in YouTube, if you type in Tony Robbins 9-11, that'll that'll pretty much give you the, the, the video that I found. Um, and what I found compelling about it was that you could easily access the archetypes, uh, but also what I discovered when I began exploring it is that I could access them experientially. So that was the bit that felt really important to me. So I could access them through embodiment, through movement, through mindfulness, through posture, through my breathing, through focus, be it visual focus or, or mental focus. Uh, I could access them through storytelling, um, which I think is probably one of the most traditional ways that archetypes have been uh, accessed throughout history and across time through storytelling around the campfire and theater and of course, movies now in our modern day and in books, of course. And then I also discovered that I could blend them so I could access them through other models like uh, the four elements model and also the embodied yoga principles, which Mark Walsh created. Um, and I've been studying them for quite, quite a while now. And we're gonna be using some of these EYP poses uh, on, today's, uh, on today's session. So, Huge shout out and thanks to Mark for uh, introducing me to that work because I know it's uh, I know Karim here is also a teacher of that so hope I don't get it wrong. <laughs> um, and what I found is that it had a really profound effect on me, uh, but it also had a very strong effect on my one on one coaching with my clients and also in kind of group workshops. Uh, the participants can get a, a lot of them uh, a lot out of that as well. So I'm going to share with you a little bit today how I blended my martial arts experience with these archetypes. And throughout the session in different points, I'm going to ask you to um, stand up and, and join me in some of these embodiment exercises. Please know that it's a choice. It's an invitation. Feel free to play along with me or not. Uh, I'll you know, leave that up to you. You're always a choice. Um, and if you'd rather sit and do them rather than stand and do them, then I'll give you some instructions around that as well so that you uh, have some alternatives to, to work with. It won't be physically demanding at all. Um, and if you do experience any discomfort, then simply stop and uh, join back in when you feel ready to do so, if that's what feels right for you. OK, so hopefully everyone feels clear about that. So let me share with you a little bit, just a little bit about my martial arts journey, and then we'll start to get into some practical, some practical stuff. So why did I personally start my martial arts journey? Um, and in hindsight, I can definitely say that I started my martial arts journey for personal healing. That was by far the most, the biggest reason that I did it. And I didn't know it at the time. The reason that I started it was because I wanted, I, I really, really lacked confidence as a teenager. Um, I was incredibly shy. Like if people looked at me, I would just blush and I'd get really tight in my throat and I couldn't speak and I just want to run away. 
So martial arts felt like a really good thing for me to get involved with. And the emotional neglect that I'd experienced in my early years, as well as my brother's suicide, really left me quite shut down and disconnected from my body. And Ken Wilber's saying, few of us have lost our minds, but most of us have long ago lost our bodies, really resonated with me when I read that. And I think that's really been the thing that's driven my journey uh, through martial arts and personal development as well. So intuitively, I knew that I had to find my way back, find my way back to my body, find my way back to my sense of my fullness. And so when I was seven years old, my dad took me to see the first ever Star Wars movie, A New Hope. Are there any Star Wars fans out there? Just say yes in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Star Wars is great. I love Star Wars. And in that dark cinema, I discovered a passion for something that was mystical. I was only about seven or eight. And it really lit me up from the inside. And of course, in the movies, they, they refer to that as the force. But it really felt like it was a real thing. And the following year, he took me to see The Empire Strikes Back, which uh, for me is the, 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 the best movie ever. And in that movie, you meet Master Yoda. And I knew in that cinema that I had to meet a Master Yoda in my life. And I've been really fortunate in that I've actually met quite a few Master Yodas. Um, and those people have really been the key to my healing and reclaiming my wholeness. So really this whole talk is a nod to those people that have been instrumental in me getting as far as I have on this journey so far. So the first Yoda that I met in my life was my martial arts teacher, my martial arts master. And so martial arts really has been one of the, the probably the most important part of that journey. And there have been lots of really amazing moments, but there have been four landmark moments for me uh, in martial arts, and they happen to coincide really nicely with four archetypes. So the first one is the warrior archetype. And one of the things that really drew me to martial arts was the physical training. I really loved the physicality of it and how demanding it was. But the landmark moment was a weekend training course where we did something that we refer to as bogeyman training. And this was training where you really connect him with this warrior spirit within. And it was exhilarating. It was powerful. It was inspiring. It was electrifying. It was just a, a really awesome experience where you immerse yourself in the, the, the power of the body in combat. And it was really amazing. When I was doing that stuff, I felt centered and I felt confident and I felt that ability to really step forward and commit myself to things, to cut through all the bullshit that might be getting in the way around self-doubt and fear and worry, um, and to really focus on things and feel grounded and fierce at the same time. So it really encapsulated a, a, a range of things that were just really, really powerful. And so there are qualities in that that I like to be able to bring out in my clients and bring out in myself when I feel that it's necessary. And so this is going to be the first sort of interactive bit now where we can step up, if you want, to uh, embody the first archetype, which is warrior. So for this, if you step forward with one leg, it doesn't really matter which leg you step forward with, but your weight is on the front leg. And the most important thing from a 
an embodied perspective is that you're aligned from your pelvis, shoulders and head. And if you're standing, your feet will be aligned as well. If you're sitting, then just have your feet flat on the floor. So you'll feel that alignment and that strength through your body. And then if you imagine that you're holding a sword in EYP, we call this enter pose or entering pose. But for me, this really encapsulates warrior. So imagine you're holding a sword with both hands. If your right leg is forward, the right hand is forward, okay, with the left hand behind it. And imagine that sword projecting forward towards the wall in front of you. And you're gonna focus on that wall. And there's a forward feeling to this. Feel the strength in your body, feel the groundedness of the, feet, of the feet, but also really focus on the point that you're focusing at. This could be a goal that you're trying to achieve or some kind of end result or a challenge that you feel confronted by. But whatever that is that you're focusing on, be aware of your body and ask yourself, does this feel familiar to me? Is this something that I perhaps long for or have too much of in my life? Maybe I feel like I'm driving forward too much in my life. And maybe ask yourself the question, where could I use it in my life as well? And then from there, once you get that sense of that, that posture, just stepping back and shaking the body gently, moving the body, easing the body a little bit. And then when you're ready to come back to the screen. And I'd be curious to hear in the chat what, what experiences came up for people while they were doing that posture? What felt like they were connecting into from that warrior archetype? Anything that people want to put in the chat? Confusion and impatience, a sense of determination. Yeah, imagining about my new buzz project. Heavy arms, very easy for me to access, slightly unstable. Yeah, Sometimes bringing the weight onto the front leg is important. Yep, clarity. Warrior is really good for clarity. Confidence all will be okay. Brilliant. Determination and commitment. Love the focus and felt a bit wobbly. Yeah, maybe you want to complete a project that needs some tidying up. Great. We'll stay on the call and then you can do it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, focus. Great yoga pose. Yeah. Great. The Chat's coming through really quick, so apologies if I'm missing anyone, any anything. A rise in energy. I had goosebumps as we were as you were speaking. Yeah. Great. I can't, I don't know. That's lovely comment, uh, Chavone. Thank you. Um, yeah, great. So feels like warrior is quite alive in people, which is wonderful. So Let's move on. We're going to come back to all of these archetypes in a minute. We're going to do a little, a little sequence that we're going to work with. But I'm just introducing each archetype to everybody right now. So the second archetype that, uh, that we're going to work on now is sovereign. And again, the, the landmark moment for me in my martial arts career was really studying what we refer to as Zen philosophy. And we would talk about this as self-defense for the mind. Um, so learning to harness the mind so that we can manage our life more effectively so that we can thrive and flourish in life rather than being at the whim of our own negativity or the things that are beyond our control. And so what we would look at in Zen philosophy is things like you know, how to work with your inner critic, how to activate and inspire your inner leader, um, working with your values and with your a sense of purpose and meaning in your life so that you're really tapping into your own self-responsibility and your own self-authority so that you can become the author of your life. You have control over your life and an awareness of where your control ends 
and where other peoples begin. And from the perspective of warriorship, which is what martial arts is about predominantly, it's kind of about having things clear in your mind so that your house is in order, um, so that you can walk through life with a sense of dignity and calm, even though there might be things going on around you right now that are quite challenging. Um, and if you can really embody that for yourself, then that puts you in a really good position to make that possible for other people. So one of the wonderful things about sovereign is that in your own thriving and flourishing, it makes it possible for other people to thrive and flourish as well. And one of the things that I really loved from one of the talks earlier this week by, um, oh, who was it? Uh, Prentice Hemphill, I think on the Trauma and Social Change channel, they were talking about non-negotiable dignity uh, through the th working through the spine. And this is very much what we're going to be tapping into today. So we're going to do our second embodiment exercise. So again, if you'd like to take, take a stand or if you prefer to sit, then that's, that's fine. So this is from the yoga world. This is basically mountain pose. But again, with EYP, rather than having the feet together, your feet are shoulder width apart. Again, aligning the feet and the hips and the shoulders and the head. And if you're seated, feet flat on the floor as well. And the first thing we're doing is getting that sense of alignment and then relaxing the muscles through the front of the body. Feeling the weight dropping into the floor so that we feel grounded. And then as we relax, feeling the ground push back up so that we're feeling supported by the ground. And so it gives us this sense of lengthening. So we're getting this up and down movement through the spine. So we're taking up space and that frees us to feel that openness across the chest and also forwards and backwards as well. So we're getting this real sense of taking up space and owning your authority. This sense of dignity through the up and down axis and connection in the right and left axis. And getting a sense in the body of, does this feel familiar? Does this feel longed for? And thinking about, so where is, where does, where is my responsibility? in my life? Do I need to take on more or maybe step back a bit and take on less to allow, allow others to flourish? Where could I use this in my life? What areas in my life, maybe in my relationships where I can take control of my responsibility? And then again, moving the body, moving the feet, and then gently coming back to the screen when you're ready. And again, inviting everybody, if they feel that they would like to, to share a little bit about what came up for them in that sovereign inquiry. inquiry. Anything coming up there? Powerful question. What area am I responsible in my life? This hit home. Did not understand the embodiment part of this. Yeah, feeling that sense of what it feels like in your body to be stood that way. What are you like a stand for? What would you like to commit to? Yeah, taking on too much responsibility, emotional. Definitely I do, I could do with stepping back. Yeah, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. Stiff when I haven't used it enough. It felt familiar, but I also noticed tension. Maybe done it for, for too long, yeah. Stillness is helpful to get perspective. Yeah, brilliant. It helped me to be present, grounded, and be aware that I'm aware of my presence. Yeah, nice. I'm okay to take space, yeah. I feel adult. It feels right, but relatively new. Yeah, yeah, I, same, similar experience for me. It felt tree-like. 
Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I really love that up and down, that rootedness, so that there is this sense of being grounded, but also this sense of connecting to something bigger. Yeah. Agree with Thera about stillness and perspective. Yeah, great. Cool. So now let's move on to our third, this third landmark moment for me, which for me was around poetry. And again, another one of my weekend courses. And we spent the weekend working with our creativity and our imagination and inspiration. And we spent the weekend working on koans, which are just kind of very short Japanese poems that are quite a big thing in Japanese martial arts and Japanese philosophy. And the homework for the weekend was uh, for 15 or 20 minutes every day to write creatively, to write poetically about any topic that you wanted to. Not to read it, but simply to enjoy the process of creating. And then after doing that, to burn what it is that we wrote. And to do that every day for a year, that was the challenge. And that's what I did. And it, and so the learning was to enjoy the creative process for its own sake, not to write anything good, not to write anything that you're gonna publish, but to simply enjoy the creative process, which was so important. Because if you want to do something that's good, then that is the thing that usually gets in the way of that creative process. And so I went back to my teacher a year later and said, right, I've done that. Now what do I do? And he said, keep doing it every day, write for at least 15 or 20 minutes, but this time keep it. Read it if you want. But basically, and now what I have is this massive pile of books that I've written in over the years. And for those of you that know me, I do loads and loads of blogging. I write articles. Um, I've published one book uh, with, with, a, with a co-author, and I'm currently writing um, another book about the art of listening. And so it was really about that creativity that was the point. But it's being open to that creative process, which, again, in that warrior context is really, really important because you need to be adaptable. You need to be creative in the moment. And what that magician quality really brings out is for real life is about leadership, being able to lead yourself and to be creative in the way that you lead your life, as well as that spiritual connection to something bigger. Um, so that you can connect into a broader perspective. So again, these are the qualities of magician. So this is another invitation to do a third posture. So again, if you'd like to join me. So for this one, uh, in EYP, we refer to it as transcendence pose. There are lots of, a few poses that we could do for magician, for all of the archetypes, in fact. So for this one, we're, we're coming up slightly on the balls of our feet. And if you're seated, don't worry about this one because we'll be lifting the body soon. But coming up onto the balls of the feet as much as feels comfortable. So you're gonna feel a little bit wobbly because there's something about creativity where you don't necessarily wanna be grounded you, you want to be light and open to whatever it is that's coming, that inspiration. And so from here, up on the balls of the feet and bring the arms up. So we're reaching up towards the ceiling, looking up towards the ceiling, having the chest open to receive. And you also may be like twiddling your fingers a little bit as you're receiving inspiration from the world around you so there's a lightness and an openness and a receptivity and maybe if you do feel the experience of getting inspiration then bring it into your body so maybe bring it to your heart or to your stomach area and then reach up for the next bit of inspiration and again bring it down to your body but always keeping yourself open to that inspiration and receptivity 
David, could you take a step back a little bit for yeah. people to see the, the right. what's going on? In yeah, the... just, just my hands are twiddling. That's all it is. Reaching up to there. And then from here, lowering the arms, lowering the heels, coming back to that grounded place on the floor, moving the body, and then coming back to the screen. And again, as before, just keen to hear what people, what showed up for people. Felt energizing, loved that, so playful and alive. Yeah, it's a really great pose. Yeah, unbalanced. Yeah, like I said, that creative process is often quite, quite unbalanced, but that's where the openness comes, if you can be with that. Yeah, definitely easier to breathe. That's really important. Once the fingers wiggled, the energy ran down the spine to the toes. Wow, that sounds great. So much in life to explore and expand. Yeah, if for me to write, even just for 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is something about writing and, and just doing it regularly. And part of that exercise on that weekend was not to wait for inspiration, but to be in a place where you can court inspiration, which was something that was really powerful for me. Yeah, multiple connection. As soon as I let go of trying to balance, I just relaxed in my posture. I stood very powerfully. Yeah, yeah. There is something about just being with, being unstable. Yeah, lovely. Uh, Christina, that's good. Okay, so the final one, the final archetype that I want to explore with you today. So I started teaching officially in 1996. I got my black belt. Uh, I think I saw a question earlier. What martial arts style do I do? It's called Bushido. Um, it's only in the UK, the Bushido Academy of Martial Artists. Um, and in the UK, there are dojos all around the country. Um, and so when I started to teach, then I began this journey into how to relate to people and how I impact people and how I can inspire and motivate, build trust with people and, in, and create emotional safety so that I could pass on to people what had been such a phenomenal benefit to me. And then when I started doing my life coaching training, the coactive life coaching training that Martin mentioned at the beginning, I really began to develop that skill of being able to listen and develop uh, empathy, uh, which has been phenomenal um, for my own for my own development, but also, you know, finding peace with lots of family issues that have come up and learning how to really listen to people. And then also as a, a Samaritans listening volunteer, uh, learning to develop that emotional range. So learning to be with lots, a very broad range of emotions, some of which can be very, very challenging uh, in that Samaritans context, but incredibly uh, fulfilling work. And so what Lover has done, for me anyway, is it's felt like Lover has softened some of those harder edges of sovereign and warrior and magician. Um, not that they're all hard edges, but they tend to be harder than Lover is. So Lover really softened that. But there is also a fierceness to Lover that I adore. Uh, and so um, it's not all about softness. Uh, and that's really important when you're doing martial arts and when you're doing coaching too. So just beginning to explore that a little bit too. So if you'd like to come up, this is the fourth and final um, archetype that we're going to be working on embodying. These are just access points and there are lots of access points. So for this one, we're going to be doing a care pose or a containment pose for those of you that know EYP. And for this one, we're just bringing the weight back onto the back leg. So there's just a ever so slight weight here, nothing too severe, and also softening the spine a little bit so that there's this sense of receiving. And from that posture through the spine there, and if you're seated to feet flat on the floor, but working on softening that spine, 
and bringing the arms round like you're holding a beach ball in front of you. So you're like that. And your arms are soft and you're looking down into this container. And these are the things that you care about. These are the things that you want to bring your attention to. It could be relationships, it could be work things, it could be health things for you, something personal, but whatever it is, these are the things that are really important to you, that you care about. And then what you can do is you can turn your hands around so that there is this sense of keeping out what you want to perhaps put to one side or deal with later on. So where the palms are in, this is what I hold to care for and contain. And with my hands out, this is what I'm keeping away for now, consciously, not unconsciously, so uh, like denial, but a sense of consciously keeping away what will interfere with what I care about. And again, asking yourself that question, does this feel familiar? Does it feel longed for? And maybe where in my life could I bring this in? And again, relaxing the arms, stepping back, moving the body to relax and coming back to the screen. And for a, a final time, I invite you to share with us what you experienced there. Thank you, Kat, for that message. I'm good at the palms in stuff, but not so good at the palms. Yeah, the boundary stuff is really difficult. Yeah, lots of smiling faces around boundaries. Yes and no. Very emotional. Brings me to my role as lover and mother, caring for my family. Maternal towards myself. Yeah, beautiful. This is thinly one that felt familiar, yeah. For now in the COVID times, oh, no, that drifted by, sorry. Uh, like this one. Yeah, some emotions, very emotional. Yeah, I felt the focus much stronger when I turned my palms out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being able to say no so that you can really concentrate on the things that you say yes to. Yeah, I, I find that incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah, something about fierce, gets more fierce. I like that one, yeah. Okay. So, really beautiful really beautiful. So we can use these archetypes or these access points for the archetypes to have individual inquiries. But I'm a martial artist and martial arts is all about forms. Um, in Japanese, we call them kata. But uh, so what I'm going to do now is take you through a little form, a little kata. Uh, working with a slightly different order. But what I'd like you to do is bring to mind a current challenge or a topic or a goal that you'd like forward movement with. So just for your own personal awareness so that you've got something to really focus on. And then that's gonna be the, the focal point of this form as we go through the different archetypes and we begin to ask the question about how do I move forward with that from the perspective of each archetype, right? I hope that's clear for everyone. Can I have a thumbs up from people just to make sure that we're, we're all good with that? Yeah, 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 great, okay. So we're just gonna go through each one once, okay? Because I think we're a little bit close on time. Um, and I want to leave some time for Q&A. So if you'd like to stand, so keeping in mind throughout what this challenge is that you would like forward movement with. So let's start with sovereign. So that's feet, shoulder width apart, feeling the ground, relaxing the front of the body, 
and feeling the ground support you. So you have this lengthening of the body, this embodiment of dignity, like you're a, a sovereign with a crown on your head. So you want to maintain that uprightness, that sense of dignity and responsibility. And thinking to yourself with this particular challenge or goal, where are my responsibilities in this? Can I perhaps give some of that responsibility away to other people to allow them to flourish? And how can I flourish and thrive in this particular challenge? Or how can other people flourish and thrive in this particular challenge? Just staying with this sense of groundedness and e lengthening of the spine as you inquire with that. And now from here, we'll move to magician. So coming up onto the balls of the feet as much as feels comfortable and bringing the arms up, reaching up towards the ceiling, opening the chest, tingling the fingers. What can you create from this challenge or this goal that you're trying to achieve? What inspiration are you open to? What would you like to create? What new things would you like to create as well? And also what broader perspective could you have perhaps that would help you in this particular challenge? From here, lowering the arms, lowering the heels. And then coming to now the lover pose. So the weight coming back, softening the spine and bringing the arms round. What do I need to care for in this particular challenge? What do I need to really bring my attention to in this space? And what do I need to push away? What do I need to say no to so that I can achieve this particular goal or face this particular challenge? Maybe I need to delegate. And maybe I need to include myself in the space that I want to care for. And then from here, finally, this is about the moving forward and taking action. So one leg forward, the same hand forward, like you're holding a sword and focusing on the end of the sword. How do I want to move forward here? What do I need to commit to? What do I want to really focus on? What do I need to be fierce about if I indeed need to be fierce in order to achieve this goal or face this challenge? And then from here, I invite you to drop your hands and walk forward and maybe take a little walk around your room walk around your space as you embody the sense of moving forward and meeting or taking on this goal. And then when you're ready, moving the body, relaxing the body, coming back to the screen, And again, I invite you to write in the chat, what came up for you in that experience? What feels alive for you right now? Great whole project plan. Embodied planning, yeah. 
I can, felt strong and fearless. I felt trust. Yeah. Wow. Manageable, real, some surprises. Great. Developed trust that I can step back in a specific relationship. Yeah. Felt ready. Ooh, Kathy, that sounds exciting. My structure is ready to go all out. Yeah. Staying focused throughout. Exercise showed me how badly I want my goal. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. There's something important about that. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Clear sense of purpose, but really I let it emerge in natural time. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. So just to wrap up, um, so these poses that we've looked at today uh, are just one way in which we can use archetypes for personal growth. There are, as I say, lots of access points. And for me, martial arts and life coaching are all about personal growth and using that growth then to have better relationships and more fulfilling work and being more at peace with yourself and therefore realizing your potential. Um, and so if you enjoyed what we've done today, I'm going to be running an eight week course uh, with my friend and colleague who's on the call, Thea Allison. Give us a wave, Thea. Thank you. Um, and we're going to be taking participants on a hero's journey through the archetypes. Um, someone's going to put the link for the event in the chat. Uh, it's a free event. Um, and it'll be the first session of this eight week course. Uh, but that first event is free. And then after that first event, you'll have the option of being able to uh, sign up to the full course um, after that. So uh, if I hope you enjoyed today. Uh, it looks like there's been some really um, exciting chat on here. So uh, thank you. I hope everyone really enjoyed it. And um, I'm very willing and open to answer any questions that people might have. Um, I, I've noted two questions before mm -hmm. we go um, um, move to, I saw Thea, uh, hands up. Uh, so there was a first question, I don't think it was answered. What martial arts do you practice? <laughs> so the martial arts that I do is uh, called uh, Bushido, the Bushido Academy of Martial Artists. Um, it's only in the UK that I'm aware of. And um, there are dojos all around the country. Um, yeah, and it's predominantly um, uh, a Japanese based, so it's karate. What I specialize in personally is karate, Aikido and Japanese sword. So you can probably see some how that has informed some of what I do just from the way I've done things today. OK, and I see two more. So there is one from Siobhan. When do you typically use this exercise in coaching to help clients create awareness? And this is a question mark. And the second mm. was one, I will add them because um, can you tell a, a little bit more about the EVP postures? So that. Yeah. OK, yeah, great. So um, can you just read the first question again? Just the first one, please. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Um, so, um, when, where do you, when do you use those um, postures in uh, your coaching wor work? How do you great. use them with a client? Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's a great question. So, a little bit like what we did today, um, I asked you to think of a particular goal or challenge that you wanted to uh, get some forward movement on. Um, so we could, depending on what it is that the client perhaps is struggling with, uh, then we would could use those poses uh, to have someone embody the qualities that they perhaps feel that they would like to work with. So if they wanted, they felt like they needed to be more fierce in their work, uh, in their work environment or something like that, then they would, we could work a little bit with warrior as a way of trying to get a, a, a sense in their body of what that fierceness might look like. And then we could begin to build up so that people feel that they can tap into that fierceness more and more, or maybe in relationships where they feel that they need to be more maybe compassionate, then we could use the lover archetype to uh, help people get a sense in their body of what compassion feels like. 
and they can begin to learn to practice that so that they can connect in with that as well. So hopefully that answers that that question. And it just varies depending on what what the client is working on and people are, are different. And I wouldn't always use the EYP poses. There are lots of different access points, um, as I say, but that's just one of them. Um, so you can explore it in lots of ways. It's very rich and very varied. And what was the second question, Marta, about EYP, I think? There was an inquiry if you could actually tell more about the postures, EVP postures. Right, yeah. So um, as I say, Mark Walsh um, is the founder of these EYP poses. Uh, and so predominantly they're uh, yoga based rather than um, uh, rather than based on anything else. And my understanding of them is that there is a, 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 a an understanding that we can kind of cultivate the qualities of each pose um, and, and use them in our everyday life. So again, depending on what it is that you want to be working on uh, in your life. So for me, the connection is that there is a strong connection with these poses and archetypes because you can see them. One of the things I was going to do today was um, have some uh, slides to show pictures of different archetypes, but you'll see like warrior, like statues or paintings of, of warriors in different, in different postures and in different situations. And there's a lot of connection. There's a lot of alignment with that kind of artistry and the way the body, uh, the way the body holds itself in those poses. Um, uh, sovereign is another great one uh, that you see uh, a lot of. So we have a kind of what I love about archetypes is that there's this kind of intuitive understanding of them. And for me, I love the poetry of that. I love the poetry of the fact that we kind of already know what sovereignty feels like in our body. We already know what uh, lover feels like in our body. So it's allowing ourselves to become more familiar with that. Um, and EYP, I think, is very much based on those sorts of principles um, and strongly connected to the archetypes as well. Okay, one more question. Great, thank you. So there is uh, one from Georgina and uh, she is asking, is it right to say warrior, sovereign, magician and lover are masculine uh, psyche archetypes? What are the feminine archetypes? So um, I think that there is a strong understanding from people that Jung, who, who kind of came up with this first idea of archetypes, um, talked about them in that masculine way. But my understanding is that you can have a, a masculine and a feminine side of all of those archetypes they'll just look and feel slightly different. So, uh, you know, a female, a feminine warrior will look and feel very different perhaps from a male warrior, but that doesn't mean that the feminine doesn't need to have that fierceness or doesn't benefit from that fierceness. And then lover, there's the softness of lover sometimes. And then that doesn't mean that the masculine can't be soft as well, you know. You might want that as a father, for example. Um, and, you know, if you're in business, then you might feel that you want the fierceness of warrior in the feminine or in a relationship. You might feel that you would want that fierceness in the feminine. Um, so I kind of challenge that sense that the that those four archetypes are just masculine or male archetypes. I would say that there's a lot of room for uh bringing masculine and masculinity and femininity into both. Okay. Thank you, David, so much for this beautiful session. We are moving towards the end. So I will just use uh, a few minutes for some, a few announcements before I go back to your uh, top tip for embodiment. Mm. Um, so yeah. thank you very much for, uh, for your session and for the, um, showing us how to embody those archetypes. Uh, I personally find it very useful and I can see what I'm missing. 
Um, so I also hope you all enjoyed the session and uh, please remember uh, you can rewatch it and it's available for free for 48 hours after this session. And um, please remember, or remember also about this um, opportunity to own the whole library or to own uh, sessions from a particular channel for a lifetime so that you can actually uh, watch it and digest uh, this content, this beautiful con content and insights uh, from our uh, presenters in your own time just to allow, it will allow you to take in the information, which is a lot from one hour. So imagine from so many sessions and you can do so by upgrading your account. You will find the link uh, in the chat already that it is there. Um, and also we think about those um, upgrades as a way to say thank you to the whole conference team who put it all together. And uh, thanks to them, uh, so many people are able to access um, this knowledge and this insights also for, for free. So these contribution, contributions helps, uh, help us to make this conference actually possible. Uh, you can... Um, uh, remember that if you do own the library, there are additional things like summaries and also uh, learning cues. So if you like uh, structured learning, it's something for you. Um, and also you can find in the chat link to our Facebook group. Please join if you haven't done it already and uh, use coffee breaks. Uh, I really do encourage you to join in with other people, feel the community have a chance to talk with uh, other people who are here with us in this um, conference. Um, next session is uh, with Annabelle Apeson on uh, from self-awareness to sensitivity and uh, authority, self-authority into the world. And David, back to you, your top tip, how to stay embodied in one sentence. How to stay embodied. Mm. Mm. To breathe and to feel into your body as much as you can. And if it feels powerful, be that powerful vulnerably or powerfully fiercely or anything else, then work towards that power. Oh, I can feel it through my body. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, David, for this thank session. You.